over thousands of years, Dublin, Ireland has been a brutal combat zone, a bullseye for raiding tribes and powerful empires. But the same forces that repeatedly sacked the city also made it the city it is today. From an underground Viking waterway. We must travel now because the water levels is going to rise. And mysterious tombs older than both the pyramids of Egypt and Stonehenge. If you're claustrophobic, this is the worst thing imaginable. To a deep, dark cave that was the site of a Viking slaughter. All the older men had chopped off or sold straight to the hunt. And a grisly crypt preserving the secrets of these ancient mummies. This is a whole nother body. Look at the teeth. The skull is just right under there. And even a link to the legendary Knights Templar. But his ties are crossed, and that is the way they used to bury crusaders. Just beneath Dublin's busy streets and pubs are the scars of its violent past. Oh, wow. We're peeling back the layers of time on Cities of the Underworld. Viking Underground. With 1.1 million residents, Dublin is the largest city in Ireland, and its median age of 34 is the youngest in Europe. But there are pubs here older than the United States, and if you go below the streets, you go even further back in time, to an age of mystery and terror. I'm Don Wildman. I'm in Dublin, Ireland. It's an ancient city filled with a young and sometimes raucous crowd. But as the locals here take to the streets and pubs above, the remains of this city's savage and bloody past are hidden just below their feet. Viking slaughters, ancient warrior tombs, pagan worship, and the scars of brutal warfare are still here underground. Like in most old cities, Dublin's modern structures have all but swallowed up their ancient sites. But if you can find the entrances to this subterranean world, you can discover Dublin's dark secrets. In the 8th century BC, the Vikings exploded onto the world scene. They terrified people throughout Europe, the Middle East, and even reached America's shores 500 years before Columbus. The Viking Age began with a bang in 793, when the pirates of Norway pillaged a peaceful abbey in northern England. The monks there were killed, thrown into the sea, or carried away as slaves along with the church's treasures. Word of the brutal assault shocked all of Europe, and the Vikings were instantly and forever demonized. The Vikings sacked Paris, destroyed London with a fleet of 350 ships, and in 830 AD, they landed in Ireland, sailing into Dublin Bay and up the Liffey River. It's the largest river in the area, flowing 72 miles upstream, so from the Liffey, the Vikings could raid and plunder villages throughout the countryside. Once they had dominated the Liffey, their military base in Dublin grew quickly into a big city, fueled by the slave trade and looted treasure. Today, that ancient Viking stronghold and its strategic waterways are long gone. But how did an entire waterway, the backbone of the Viking conquest, disappear? A thousand years ago, Dubliners could dip a bucket in the river and pull out drinking water. But today, to set foot in the Pottle River, you need special permission from the city of Dublin and a guide like David Green from the drainage department. Um, it's a dangerous area. You have to be careful when you're traveling because of the toilets. You can get caught out just like ah, people traveling the caves at sea. Right. So uh, the toilets are in our favor and also the sky is in our favor. All right. I must give you your gear right. and your protective sure. gear that you need on the journey. This here, Don, is your private oxygen supply. Oh. It's about 20 minutes of oxygen. It's a good thing to have it in your possession okay. because you're traveling underground. So Don, will you hold the ladder and uh, I'll get down to make sure everything is okay. It's a lot deeper than I thought it was going to be. And much more water. I mean, there's a real river down there. Here we go, down under Dublin.
Just below this street is something most lifelong Dubliners have never seen, the river that gave birth to their city. But it was also ground zero for a Viking reign of terror, the launch point for hundreds of bloody raids on the Irish countryside. This is the old Dublin. OK, so now this is river water coming from where? This is pure river water. And this is the drinking water that the people of Dublin okay. used to drink back through the centuries. The river that was once the lifeline for the Vikings is now just a bricked over culvert. And crouched under these low ceilings, it's hard to believe Viking ships once sailed through here. So tell me how the Vikings attacked the city first. Well, they came up um, the River Liffey from Dublin Bay in their ships. Mm -hmm. and, and their ships, uh, not only themselves, was equipped with armor. But the ships told people, be aware, this is a conquering situation. The Viking longship was a devastating marine assault vessel with a simple design perfected over hundreds of years. It took about 80 trees to produce one boat. These 100-foot long ships could sail at full speed in only three feet of water. At its height, Dublin received 140 shiploads of warriors a year. The Vikings sailed their longships up the Liffey and found this, the River Pottle. The spit of land between the two rivers was the perfect location for a fortress, with stone barricades on the sides facing the rivers. The natural pool where the two rivers met was 39 feet deep and 72 feet wide, and they called it Dark Pool, or Dublin. From Dublin, they used the Pottle River as a highway to plunder silver, lumber, and slaves. Slavery was a big business. By 950 AD, 10% of the European population was enslaved, many of them victims of Viking raiders. And it all began right here, 10 feet below today's streets, in the subterranean channel that snakes along for almost four miles under modern Dublin. But how did such an important river and the Viking settlement around it get pushed 10 feet under a busy city? The answer can be found in the Pottle's erratic and sometimes deadly torrents. There's not too much water down here today, but normally, I mean, on a rainy day, this would be quite a torrent, I would think. Yeah, on, on heavy rain, this would fill up like a milk bottle. The Pottle still intersects with the uncovered Liffey River, and during heavy rainstorms, the Liffey will rise as much as 14 feet. When the Liffey goes up, so does the Pottle. Back in the 9th century, when it was an open river, it often flooded the Viking longhouses along the banks. When the Normans defeated the Vikings and conquered Ireland in the 12th century, they channeled the river into a moat around Dublin Castle. As the Pottle River was tamed, medieval residents began using it as an open sewer. Over time, the sewer was covered and modern Dublin was built on top. To keep the city from collapsing into this underground river, Medieval builders reinforced the sewer with brick archways and barrel vaulted ceilings. The brickwork here is structurally, it seems like this is pretty old to be holding up modern day Dublin, right? Yeah. I mean, this is 400 year old. This is it. These, are, these are the foundation stone of the upper grounds of the castle. Does that make you feel a little, uh, a little shaky, maybe? Yeah, at times. In fact, Dave and his co-workers now follow the exact path of the ancient Viking raiders, trudging through the guts of the city to keep it safe from collapse. We must travel now because the water levels is going to rise, okay. and I want to get you out safely. That's the River Liffey, John. That's amazing. So we have just, how far have we walked here? I'd say about two miles. Two miles, underneath of Dublin. Underneath the heart of Dublin. An amazing opportunity, you know, Dublin walked two miles underneath of modern-day Dublin. Up there, it's, it's coffee shops, cafes. Down here, it's antiquity, you know, right under the surface of the streets. The countryside around Dublin is peaceful now. But back in the 9th century, swift, vicious Viking raids rocked the small farming villages. Out in these open fields, there was no place to hide. The community needed a subterranean refuge, a medieval bunker. So they began to dig a tunnel into a nearby hill. But as they were digging, the locals found something unbelievable. 
they ran into a massive tomb, a prehistoric lair built thousands of years earlier. I'm just north of Dublin. I'm so psyched. I'm going to see an archaeology site that's more than 4,000 years old. This isn't even history, it's prehistory. In 2500 BC, the inhabitants here literally changed the landscape, building towering burial mounds like this. It's older than both the pyramids in Giza and Stonehenge. But who were the people who built it? And why did they put themselves through such backbreaking labor? Was this tomb their portal to the afterlife? An ancient observatory or something else? Professor Annabaugh Kilfeather met me just an hour outside of Dublin at a place called Douth, a 60-foot high, 4,500-year-old mound, a mysterious earthwork of a prehistoric cult. So from this side, you can really see the shape of yeah. the mound and how steep it is. And the immensity of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so much work went into building this. Absolutely. How many people would it have taken to make this happen? Communities from all over the valley came together to build the mound. So together. it's like the, the Amish in the States raising a barn. This is a mound raising. It would have taken, you know, hundreds of people, years, maybe a generation, okay. to build up something this big. Because it looked like a natural hill, no one discovered what lay beneath the mound for centuries. This is the way in. Follow me. Okay. The inner chambers of the mound are off limits to the public, but we had special permission to go inside. Squeeze. To see things hidden from most human eyes for centuries. Not so at all. Claustrophobic. This is the worst thing imaginable. Look how tight it is. It's unbelievable. The man made hill actually contains two structures built over 3,000 years apart. The original 4,500 year old passage tomb lies closer to the center of the mound. But off to the side is a much newer construction a 9th century warren of small chambers and a narrow tunnel that leads back into the ancient tomb. All right. OK, here we are. This is one of uh, two beehive chambers. So what do they use this space for? And they seem to have been used uh, for storage, of, for valuables, and also possibly for refuge. Now, um, as you can see, uh, down the passage we came, it's very, it's very difficult to get down. Right. It's, it's kind of restrictive. It's difficult to get into. A thousand years ago, villagers burrowed into this 4,500-year-old hill, retrofitting the tomb into a medieval bunker in which to hide their valuables or themselves when Vikings stormed the village above. Were there battles, wars fought in this area? Well, there's a reference in the 9th century to the Vikings attacking Douth. Mm -hmm. If they were in danger of attack from the Vikings, they would have needed somewhere to store their valuables hidden so from presumably anybody. So the whole village could have come down here. And if they could, hidden. exactly. These watertight chambers dug down beside the much older tomb protected the medieval villagers and their goods from bad weather, as well as from marauding Vikings. No mortar was used in a corbelled structure like this. A ring of stones was laid out, and sometimes a wooden pillar or mound of earth was set up inside as a guide and a support. Each new layer was then set closer to the center. The stones all tilted slightly downward so that the rainwater could run off. When they neared the top, the medieval peasant builders removed the center guide, and the chamber was completed. It was hard work, but at a time when Viking raiders could burn and pillage a town in just a few minutes, it was absolutely essential. As remarkable as this piece of Viking-era engineering is, there's another structure within the mound that's far more impressive and 3,500 years older. Just 27 feet away from the 9th century beehive rooms, down a narrow passageway, is the central chamber of the Neolithic tomb, 11 feet high, built out of massive boulders, and about 500 years older than Stonehenge. Yeah, look at this. This definitely has a feeling of an entryway into a tomb. I mean, it's a little eerie, huh? And very, very prehistoric. Oh, here we go. 
Very little is known about the people who built this tomb, how they constructed it, or exactly what pagan rituals were performed here. It was built probably around 2,500 BC, so it's about four and a half thousand years old. About 500 years older than Stonehenge, uh -huh. it's older than the pyramids. Some of the pillars of Stonehenge have toppled over, ravaged by the centuries. But the north tomb of Douth is perfectly preserved, just as its builders left it about 4,500 years ago. Unlike Stonehenge, Douth was used for burying cremated remains of the elite, but Douth is more than just a simple tomb. Because it was such a monumental task to build it, there's speculation that a vital and long-forgotten ritual took place down here. It's like a jumble of rocks. It's believed that these Neolithic people worship their ancestors, a tradition carried on by the Celts, with Samhain, the festival of the dead, a rite that mutated into today's Halloween. On Samhain, offerings of food and drink are left out for the ancestors, but if the dead feel they haven't been properly honored, they'll drag their own descendants back with them into the cold, dark afterworld. Such offerings were left in this very room, but no one knows if they were meant to help the dead on their journey or keep them away from the living. It has a very ceremonial feeling mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. I mean, these, these monolithic stones as you enter into this central space mm -hmm. are really impressive, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, this is just one giant yeah. boulder. Huge piece, absolutely huge I piece of stone. I can't even imagine how they moved it, mm -hmm. much less set it into place for 4,000 years. Some speculate that the massive rocks of Stonehenge were moved with rollers and manpower alone. This structure could have been built the same way, thousands of years before cranes and bulldozers. Look at the stability of this. It's just insane how this has lasted so long. And it, you have another gigantic rock right above it, and there's no mortar. These are just rocks sitting on rocks. How they move these enormous monolithic stones will remain a mystery, but this Neolithic cult may have left behind a clue to their secret pagan rituals. And Don, if you look down here, mm -hmm. There's some artwork. Oh, yeah. We call megalithic art. To the modern eye, that looks like a sunburst, yeah, since we know that the, the passages seem to be orientated either on moon or sun events. I think this is quite likely to be maybe a representation of the sun coming down into the tomb. Just as one massive block of Stonehenge was aligned perfectly with the rising sun on the summer solstice, the Neolithic monuments of Ireland seemed linked to the heavens as well. A passage tomb one mile away from Douth was designed so that on the morning of the winter solstice, a beam of light enters the chamber through a roof box, hitting a rock at the end of the passageway and lighting up a carved orthostat. The southern passage in Douth may have been similarly designed to light up at sunset on the solstice. Like the formation of stones at Stonehenge, the positioning of this tomb may have kept track of the seasons, predicted eclipses, or been part of a pagan ritual honoring the sun. These megalithic stones weigh several tons, and like the building of Stonehenge, no one quite knows how this tomb was constructed. The tomb and its builders remain one of the greatest mysteries in a land filled with myths and legends. In the 9th century, bloody Viking raids spread out from Dublin and into the countryside. Because their longships were lightning fast and their weapons were deadly, the attacks were swift and brutal. Most villages had no refuge, and in the end, the only place for locals to escape the Viking slaughter was a deep, dark cave, a place they thought of as hell. This area is famous for its massive limestone caves. In ancient times, the people who lived in this region thought of them as entrances into hell. They wouldn't go near them. But recently, some spelunkers made a series of gruesome discoveries in a nearby cave that may change the story. They found 1,000-year-old human bones. That meant, at one point in time, the locals did, in fact, enter the caves. Now, if they were so afraid, what could possibly drive them to literally go into hell? Well, according to an old Irish legend, there's only one thing more terrifying than hell, the Vikings.
My guide, Michael Keogh, has lived in this area all his life. He's explored the caves extensively over the years. So, Don, you can see the entrances here. Oh, yeah. A very spectacular entrance. Well, I'll say it's huge. This is naturally formed. It happened over 3,000 years ago. Uh -huh. When the little field up above here, where we're standing, fell right in. And all the material in that field fell down and formed the big, long slope that you see in front of us here. The collapse created this enormous natural amphitheater, 65 feet deep. Over 400 steps lead down to the farthest reaches of the cave. It's a thousand-year-old crime scene stained with the bloody fingerprints of the Vikings. Boy, you can really feel it getting colder down here, huh? Yeah. Just like that. Now, Don, we're at the lowest part of the caves, which is about 180 feet below the ground here. Well, going back, I suppose, um, a couple of thousand years ago, people were dead scared of coming in here. Uh, it was regarded as the lair of a giant monster, probably because when you're coming down into the mouth of the cave, you see all the unusual-looking stalactites hanging down from the ceiling, and they could look like the teeth of a big monster with his mouth open, okay. looking up there. So this was a, a no-go territory. The bizarre rock formations that terrified locals were formed over thousands of years as rainwater leached calcite deposits into the top of the cave, leaving behind stalactites. Then 3,000 years ago, a huge section of the roof collapsed, revealing the gaping mouth of Dunmore Cave, 39 feet wide and 20 feet high. Today, rainwater is still working away at the rock. The chamber we're in is only held up by two slabs of rock nearly 100 feet apart. So this limestone ceiling is only supported along the back wall over there, and also the little triangle behind us here. Man, so this entire slab of limestone, countless tons of stone, is only being held up by two places far apart from each other. That's right, yeah. So it makes sense to me that this entire thing is going to come down someday. At some time. In fact, 50,000 years ago, a section of the ceiling gave way, and these enormous boulders crashed down, blocking this part of the tunnel and creating the only hiding place for terrified villagers. But when an archaeologist was exploring the site in 1973, he uncovered evidence that the villagers' refuge was really a death trap. Hello, come back. <laughs> in the year 928 AD, the Vikings from Dublin came here and killed a 1,000 people in this cave. Roughly under where we're standing now, mm -hmm. uh, we found the bones of 44 women and children, including two small babies. 44 people underneath here, in this chamber underneath. That's right. And you were able to date these bones? The carbon dating confirms the date early medieval, the time we're talking about. All right. So these were the people who were massacred? That's correct. Locals had feared this cave for centuries, believing it was the gate to hell and the lair of monsters. And that turned out to be true for the villagers who sought refuge here from the Vikings in 928. So you could imagine the Vikings coming down to attack. Mm -hmm. You could imagine the women and children running in and getting into hide. Sure. All the older men, my age and older, maybe head chopped off or a sword straight to the heart. Yeah. The teenage boys probably brought off to Dublin, sold as slaves. Dublin was a major slave trading port at the time. And then in this big area behind us here under our feet, Maybe one of the babies starts to cry. Mm. There's some noise. The Vikings lit some fires to try to smoke the people out. And of course, the fires used up all the oxygen, and those people slowly suffocated to death. So all 44 women and children underneath this rock, right where they laid a 1,000 years ago. That's right. At first, Vikings targeted monasteries, plundering the church's gold and silver. But they soon turned to a more lucrative business, the slave trade. Farm communities near a major river like this one became prime targets. The Viking slave trade developed into an elaborate network. They captured huge numbers of defenseless farmers from rural areas in the British Isles, Central Europe, and especially the Slavic plains to the east. In fact, the word slave referred to the Slavic people because so many of them were enslaved by the Vikings. The slave trade made the Vikings rich, each slave fetching about the same price as a head of cattle. The slaves would be gathered in major ports to be shipped to the palaces and estates of the Persian and Eastern Roman empires. 
oftentimes males were castrated and along with young female slaves were sold to harems in North Spain and North Africa. It's impossible to say where in the world slaves taken from this cave would have ended up, but one thing's for sure, many of them never made it out at all. I'll be careful. The bones found here were removed and reburied in 1973. But today, climbing down this slippery cliff is the only way to see the spot where the unlucky villagers died at the hands of the Vikings. There we go. That looks like a doorway there. I mean, some kind of opening down here. Oh, here we go. Look at this. Well, you can imagine what this was like. Almost the whole village is hiding in the dark with brutal warriors coming to get them. So the men are killed, and they find them underneath the here a thousand years later, lying right where they lied the day they were killed. In addition to the bones, coins and jewelry from across the ancient world were found deep inside the cave, fueling even more speculation. Most Vikings brought their coins and other belongings with them everywhere, even into battle. To keep their hands free at all times, they pressed the coins into the hair of their chests or armpits with wax. But during vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat or slaughters like this one, their body heat sometimes melted the wax and the coins were lost. Another more recent find suggests a different story. Vikings may have used this cave to hide their treasures. In 1999, one of the guides, he reached in at the back wall there behind us to pick off silver bracelets, hmm. followed by silver jewelry, silver coins, belt buckles. He found a whole package. silver ingots. We can only assume that the Vikings were still raiding somewhere, stole their goods, and hid them here with the intention of coming back for them. So there could be a lot more stuff in here. Quite easily it could be. Today, Dublin is the engine behind Europe's fastest growing economy. But at the turn of the 18th century, after generations of hard-handed British rule, living conditions in Dublin were awful. Famine and utter poverty were on every street corner. To deal with the problem, the aristocracy built a massive poorhouse for beggars and vagrants. And in time, thousands of sick and dying children were stuck in an overcrowded, dark and dingy basement. Because it was underground, the British believed the problem had been swept under the rug. But little did they know, the seeds of violent revolution had already been planted deep in Dublin's underworld. St. James Hospital is in the Kilmannan district of Dublin. 300 years ago, it was the site of a hospital for homeless children, then became the South Union Poorhouse, a shelter where the destitute toiled in exchange for a place to live. But no matter what they called it, it was less of a refuge and more like a prison. All of this dark history was buried in danger of being forgotten until recently. Lindsay, when archaeologist Lindsay Simpson made the discovery of a lifetime. So this is a brand new building. Yeah, it's about five years old. So you come in at the early point. You yes, before, the, before it's actually built, um, we come in as part of the site investigations. Uh -huh. so this was a car park. So that's when I discovered the, the building. You discovered it? Yeah. Down below. That's right. Today, Lindsay's discovery is accessible through a plain door in an ordinary hallway. I'm going to show you the magic door right now. And this is it here. But just 15 feet down, Dublin's dark past comes to life. Wow, you just went from uh, modern to uh, the 21st century. Exactly, back 300 years. So this is the original foundation of the found Foundling Hospital. This is the actual basement of it, so this yeah. would have been inhabited and lived in. Okay. Three centuries ago, these rooms witnessed horrible, inhumane squalor, with hundreds of homeless children crammed into these filthy, cold, and dark quarters. So this would have been one room. Yeah with hundreds of beds in here, I guess. Yes, yeah. yeah, beds are, is probably a it's kind really... way of describing it. OK, well, <laughs> platforms to sleep on. Yeah. It's really quite a picture in your head, isn't yeah. it? Cold and, and dark and dank, 
and a lot of unhappy children. Yeah. Some of them dying. We know that three quarters of the babies that came in were, didn't survive the first three year. Quarters three quarters of the children. Of the children died. British rulers in Ireland had created the orphanage, but were reluctant to waste too much money on the lowest of the low. Abandoned, illegitimate children. Underfunded and understaffed, the hospital couldn't even dole out meager daily rations to the children who were brought here. So hundreds of babies and toddlers were farmed out to wet nurses, who were paid to care for the children. But these women were poor, living in the slums of Dublin, so for them, this was a business. To keep track of the children, the hospital branded each of them on the arm. The branding was a, was a way of identifying children that had come through the workhouse. In other words, if a wet nurse came and she said, I would take three children, there was no mechanism for the founding hospital to keep a track on where, whose kids were where. So when she would come for her monthly payment, she would bring the children with her, and the branding was a means of identifying those particular children. A wet nurse could present a branded child to the hospital and receive a small monthly payment. The brands were supposed to eliminate fraud, women trying to claim their own children as hospital foundlings for a few extra dollars. There was a lot of uh, fraudulent behavior, and we know that, they, that in one incident in 1737 that, that about 15 or 16 children were found dumped in a quarry. They were all branded, they were all very small infants. So obviously a group of people had got together, taken these children and then murdered them. Gotten their payments and then murdered the children. Yeah. The inhumane treatment of children in these rooms and the discontent of British rule throughout Dublin exploded in a revolt known as the Easter Rising. On April 24, 1916, 1,000 armed Irish men and women declared all-out war on Britain, and resistance fighters chose this spot as a stronghold. I'm sure they selected the site quite carefully. It was a very important institution. There was some sort of, I think, poetic justice attached to the fact that they were fighting here, right on the site, where so many people had arrived here in such miserable conditions. Outnumbered 2,000 to one, the Irish were quickly beaten down. But when the British executed the leaders of the rebellion, the outraged people of Ireland finally mobilized against their British enemy. Fury and revolution spread across the country, and in 1921, Ireland won its freedom from Britain. Eventually, the poorhouse where the Easter Rising erupted was shut down and abandoned. The building above was torn down, sealing up the spaces below, until the year 2000, when Lindsay was called in for a routine look at the foundation. Now, this is a very unusual situation, right? Old original building, and then a brand new building designed to sit on top of it. Yes, it was a very innovative way of dealing with it because these are piles, big piling machines had to come in. Um, and it, it was very difficult actually to, to do what we're doing without damaging the walls. The original plans had to be completely scrapped. Engineers devised a method to balance the massive 32,000 square foot building over this ancient hole. Instead of laying the concrete walls of the new hospital directly onto the crumbling structure below, the engineers drove concrete piles almost 100 feet into Dublin's bedrock. All of the weight of the structure above is transferred directly into the ground below. Thanks to this ingenious engineering, this piece of Ireland's dark past is now preserved. So this is a, a triumph as far as you're concerned. Yeah, no, it, it is. It is a triumph. We're doing this for, the, for future generations. Good work. Stories of legendary warriors have been passed down for centuries, like Celtic armies fighting off Viking invaders or Knights Templar battling pagan tribes. But there's one mysterious place in Dublin where these are more than just stories, where legendary warriors refuse to die. On the north side of the Liffey River is the 400-year-old St. Michael's Church, but deep inside this medieval church is a thousand-year-old crypt, where the mystery of its ancient mummies defies both logic and science. I met with Pat Liddy, a guide to Dublin and lifelong North Sider, who got me access to some dark places where even the parishioners aren't allowed. Way down under. So this is not the original church? 
No, the, the uppermost part is uh, 1680s, uh -huh. but underneath we probably have the crypt area which dates from about a thousand years ago. The crypt beneath the church holds clues to the mystery behind the eerily well-preserved remains of its thousand-year-old parishioners. This is our entrance into the underworld. Right. And it's made so that those inside can't get out and makes it difficult for us to get in. Ugh. Big, heavy iron doors. <laughs> Here we go. And as you oh, go in, nice door. just it's very low, steps uneven, so be very yeah, careful. Yeah. And very Here dark. We go. <sighs> A thousand years back. What do you think of this? Man, it is a it's an a, authentic medieval space, huh? Have a look at what we have here. Oh, that is really creepy. It's not a place for the unwary. So how old are these these coffins? Um, the coffins range here from a mere 100 years to go back maybe 400 years. So there's a whole mess of, of mess. I mean, coffins <laughs> yes. all over. That's right. It's like if we just discovered them. There's a rat just ran across here, too. <laughs> Only the most durable coffins can withstand more than a few decades before dry rot sets in, and most corpses rot away in under a decade. After a few centuries, even skeletons turn to dust. But in this crypt lie the remains of rich men and women who defy the laws of nature in death. Look, his feet are right down here. I've never seen lying in death. never seen something like this before. Look, this is a whole other body here. That yeah, is, yeah. Yeah. Look at the teeth. The skull is just right under there. Oh. Okay, that's gross. It's an excellent argument for cremation, don't you think? Tangled skulls and bones around the tomb have been untouched for centuries. And even though they weren't properly mummified, they're almost perfectly preserved. Oh, wow. Look at this. Almost perfectly preserved bodies. So how is this so well preserved? Well, uh, partly due to the dry atmosphere created from the release of the magnesium salts from this limestone. The well, walls this... themselves are releasing a... Uh... They're releasing salt, which is absorbing any mm -hmm. dampness that might uh, occur here. Plus, a release of a gas, a methane-type gas, coming from the forest bed, which used to be here, okay. underneath us. Unlike the ritual mummification of Egypt, Ireland's mummies are caused by accident. The famous bog people were Iron Age corpses found buried in the western peat marshes and were some of the oldest and most well-preserved corpses in the world. But mummification caused by the combination of dry air and methane gas found in the crypt of St. Michael's is absolutely unique. It all began over 5,000 years ago when the ancient forest that covered this region was cut down and cleared for farming. Eventually, the modern city paved over the forest bed, which began to decompose. Methane gases were trapped beneath. As methane is slowly released into the crypt, it displaces the oxygen. Atmospheres low in oxygen slow the decomposition of corpses. The limestone used in the construction of the crypt also helps absorb excess moisture that would otherwise dissolve the calcium in the bones, leaving behind these mummies and preserving their stories it really results in a person is still there, not a... This is a person. Yeah. And we know a little something about everybody. This gentleman here, a bit of a question, perhaps 400 years old or thereabouts, mm -hmm. and he's had a couple of indignities done to him. His feet have been cut off oh. from above the ankles because coffins in those days were made to a standard size. Wow. And they couldn't fit him in without cutting off his feet. He's missing his right hand. Oh, yeah. Now, his right hand could have been lost in battle. Yeah. It could have been lost as a punishment, or it could have been disease. Uh, most likely, it was battle, uh, a sword thrust or something. <laughs> Off went the hand. Now, this is another well, very <laughs> damaged body here. He, he is the, the big shot. Oh, yeah? yeah? So he's the VIP here. He could be six to 700 years old. Really? In fact, they call him the Crusader. Why is that? Well, first of all, he's nearly seven feet tall. 
in real life. Really? They've had to, again, to break his legs to fit him into the, the coffin. OK. But his thighs are crossed, and that is the way they used to bury crusaders. So he's a warrior? He's a warrior. I mean, the Irish have always been a, a warlike nation, and we've had to be because of all the invasions we've had down the thousands of years. Mm -hmm. But the man they called the Crusader was buried a hundred years after the Crusades ended in 1272. Could he be linked to the famous and secretive society of the Knights Templar? The Knights were some of the greatest warriors of the Crusades, but their mysterious initiation rites and immense wealth and power threatened the rulers of Europe. So in 1312, the Pope had them arrested, tortured, and many of them were executed. The order apparently disbanded. Many fled to Ireland's neighbor, Scotland. And around that time, this Irish warrior was interred in the crypt. Other Templar graves have been found with leg bones removed and crossed, not unlike the mysterious crusader of Dublin, lying 10 feet under this historical church. This is a very exclusive thing, and I'm going to offer it to you now. It apparently gives you really great luck if you very gently shake his hand. This is a real thing, and it's, it's, a, it's a strong uh, belief. I have never done something like this before. <laughs> Think good of him, uh -huh. wish him well in his afterlife, and the luck will come. Who knows, he could be an ancestor of yours if the old DNA was checked on. There's Irish in there. <laughs> yeah, there you are. But I mean, I'm going to be like this. And I'm going to be like that, and we're all going to be like that. There is no exceptions to this rule. The violence that ripped through Dublin during its 4,000-year history is beginning to fade away. And a population once crippled by grinding poverty now enjoys life in a modern metropolis. But the Irish will never forget their dark past of Viking slaughters, mysterious pagan tombs, and bloody battles for independence. It's still here, just beneath the streets.